Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning study, uh, the last morning study of the week, uh, addressing Daniel chapter 11, Daniel's last vision. And um, uh, before we begin, uh, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can come together to open your word once again. We find this time together each morning, a very precious time of fellowship, of learning, of self-examination, and a revelation of Jesus Christ through his word. We invite your spirit to be our teacher and guide as we look at these scriptures uh, once again, and uh, that we can sort through these things and put them in a, an order that's easy to understand. Be with each person in their personal struggles and trials. You know, Lord, that uh, living on this earth is, is a difficult thing, and we long to be with you in your kingdom. But we just ask, Lord, that we can be there in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, and that your angels can watch over each person and their families. Be with us in all of our interactions with others, that we can reveal your character. And we pray this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again, everyone. Now, yesterday, when we were looking at this, uh, we were addressing the God of fortresses and um, and in his estate. And then uh, uh, Dwight uh, put a spanner in the works there for us. So we have from the translators a different way of looking at this verse. So this, this calls for a re-examination of verse 38 of Daniel chapter 11. Uh, I guess this is, so it's just the first part of this. I'm, I'm not sure like how these verses are divided. So that's just the first half. Oh, no, that's the whole verse. That's the whole verse 38. It's just kind of looks smaller because we don't have all the Hebrew numbers in our comments in there. So, but as for the almighty God, in his seat shall he honor, yea, he shall honor a God whom his fathers knew not with gold and silver and precious stones. And that didn't work either. Maybe I'll leave that. Um, so when we look at this, this verse in this way, so I know just jumping into it, the reason that they're translating this this way partly has to do, I think, with the word order in Hebrew. The word order is not as important in Hebrew as it is in English. Uh, but it's going to start with this phrase, uh, the God of fortresses, or as they're translating it, but as for the Almighty God. Now, they put in his seat shall be honor. And I don't see good reason to, to do that. Um, to put the word be in there. So uh, let's take a look at it this way. So we look at the Bible itself. So Daniel 11. Okay, so I know you can't read Hebrew, but it's just showing you the order of the Hebrew words. So what we have here first is this word Eloa or Yeloa. So it's, it's related to the word 430, which is also, that's which is Elohim. So this is just a, a different form of that word and just a rarer form. So we're going to see that that word um, is translated as God 56 times. Uh, first time Deuteronomy uh, 25 verse 15. Then he forsook God which made him and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. So you can see it refers to, to God. You know, it's not like a word that would refer to uh, pagan gods or anything like that. So it's just another form of, of God. And then it has ma'atz, but in the plural. So ma'atz, ma'atzim. And you can see there's this little square at the end, if you can see that on your screen. So that's just the plural. So this is, and it has a vav in the beginning and a, let me see, how did, how did they do this here? So eloa. So what they've added is they've added a vav and a lamed. Now, what does a lamed mean in the beginning of a Hebrew word? Now, the vav just means and or but, right? It's just a conjunctive. But a lamed, what is that? What does that normally mean? Right? If you put a bet, it means something is within something or on something. A lamed is a what kind of prefix to, in a Hebrew word? Anybody remember? No, I don't. It's, it's directional. Okay. 
So it, it's it's moving towards something. It's sometimes translated against as against, and sometimes translated as to. So you can see that that because of the lamid there, uh, there's something happening. So it's something to God of hosts. So the way that this is translated, and I'm just going to do this on my other computer, so I have both both translations. But when we when we're looking at the the other translation, like the King James, it's going to have but in his estate. So it's going to put these other words before. I, I think this this alternate reading actually makes more sense based upon the forms of these words. And I'm just going to look at this verse in other translations here really quickly, see what some of them do. Boy, some of these translations are very diverse. I don't, it must be a difficult, I know you can't see all these things. I'm not going to go through all these different translations, but uh, there's very diverse. Most are similar to the King James. Young's literal translation is interesting. So I'll show you this. Okay, so he has... And to the God of strongholds, in his, on his station, he giveth honor. Yea, to a God whom his fathers knew not, he giveth honor with gold and with silver and with precious stone and with des desirable things. So, uh, I mean, this is a little bit different, too, than the translator's um, alternate reading. But And to the God of strongholds on his station or on his base or on his place giveth honor it still doesn't really define exactly whose station or estate it is right whose place it is but i think the main thing that i'm looking at is that if we look at second thessalonians and we see you know he that the man of sin sits in the temple of god showing himself that he is god i think that is a strong case for taking this that the station or the estate that it's it's his station that is the god of strongholds uh station but he's not giving honor to the god of strongholds right because right. it says he giveth honor yea to the god which his fathers knew not he giveth honor and i'm not really sure I, i'm still not 100 percent certain of how to look at this um now if he's it could be saying well that he's giving honor to the god of strongholds in his place but then that would be honoring the true God. And it doesn't appear that he's honoring a true God. He's honoring some kind of other God. But the place where he's honoring him is in the temple of God. But he is the one that is the God, right? That is, you know, the thing that we're trying to figure out is, is this moving to Satan as the one who is really the God that is being worshipped, this fake God, right? This counterfeit God. So, so Young's is kind of interesting in that way. So, so we can see that there is reason to, to take this. And, that's, and, and when it's a literal translation, and to the God of strongholds, that to, that's the Lamed, because it, it can be translated as to or against. That, I mean, we could say, and, and against the God of strongholds, in his place he giveth honor, because it's just a directional, a directional prefix which can mean against, can mean to. So if we go back here to our document, so they're going to translate it as four. I, I don't know if I would translate the Lamed as four. So obviously the Vav can be translated as but. So that's how the sentence starts with the Vav and then a Lamed. So if we were going to, you know, take this, we could change this to, but to the Almighty God. That's That's more how... Young's is translating it, though he's, you know, he's using God of forces or fortresses. And, uh, but to the Almighty God, in his seat shall he honor, but maybe, maybe as to, not as for. Maybe I like that better, but as to the Almighty God. I don't know if that makes sense. In his seat shall he honor. So, He's going to honor this God whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. So, I mean, the way that we were kind of looking at this before is um, um, we've looked at this so many different ways. So <laughs> we've looked at it almost every possible way we could. But, you know, the God, the God that his fathers knew not. So he doesn't regard the God of his fathers. That is the pap papal Rome. So let's just look at the historical. 
in, in the verse above. So he doesn't honor the God of his fathers. He does not regard the God of his fathers or the gods of his fathers, that is the pagan gods. He doesn't honor or doesn't regard the desire of women. And here we are going to say that this, this is a reference to uh, the promised seed in, in the historical application. So it's a rejection of Christ. So papal Rome doesn't, doesn't regard that promised seed. Now we would say, well, he does, you know, it does. It talks about Christ and Mary and the child and so forth. But in the context of, of what that represents, that the seed of the woman bruises the serpent head and the serpent bruises his heel, how that relates to the gospel, that would be rejected. So in our time, we would be the everlasting gospel with three angels' messages. We could even just say the everlasting gospel, even in the historical application, uh, nor regard any God. So we think about uh, the papacy, it doesn't regard any God. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't have, now it does have, of course, all of these saints and everything like that. But, you know, they, they become part of that whole Catholic worship, right? So they're, they're not acknowledging, you know, any Hindu gods or, or any things like that. They have the saints that replace that. It's still kind of polytheistic in that way. But really the idea is that, that the Pope is the representative of God on earth. Now, in the, in the present truth application, then we say, well, these, these are all of these different philosophies, the UN, the WCF, all of these different things, that they're subordinate, that they're, that they're actually, they're the things through which Satan is going to exalt himself. And, and if we deal with this word regard, which we haven't, we haven't dealt with it too much, the 5921, it's a preposition. It means above. And, and it's actually uh, an ein and a lamed. So it's actually related to the lamed prefix, uh, but it's a separate word, above, over, upon, or against. So it, it really has to do with like a downward aspect. It's a directional thing. So it can mean against. So it, it's very similar to just having a lamed in front of a word. So we have that. And then we also have uh, this word not, right? So neither shall he regard. And then we have... So the word that's actually translated regard, that we really get this. Uh, so not upon him does he, if we're going to translate it more literally, he doesn't gaze or direct his attention towards something. So neither shall he regard. So that's where we get the word regard. So it's the 995. It means it's bien. It means uh to separate mentally or distinguish, that is generally understand, attend, consider, be cunning, diligent, direct, discern, eloquent, feel, inform, instruct, have intelligence, know, look well to, mark, perceive, be prudent, regard, uh, teach, think, right? So it has all of these different, understand, uh, again, these are just ways that it's, so it generally means to understand, but it, it means to separate mentally, to distinguish. So if we look at all of these, we have... Neither shall he regard. But in the idea that he's not separating mentally or understanding, attending to, considering, right? So the papacy during the, the dark, you know, the 1260, it's not, it's not giving any regard to these, to these other things. And so we're saying the God of his fathers here is pagan gods, right? So he's, he's not worshiping Apollo and things like that. Obviously, they have their saints. He's not really considering the gospel and, and what, you know, the promised seed means, the everlasting gospel, or really regarding any other God because he is magnifying himself above all, right? So we can see in, in, the, in the sense of regard, it's, it's, it's more like attending to, like, he doesn't care about any of those other gods, any, any gospel or anything. It's just... He's magnifying himself. Now, that's, of course, the papacy. But in the present truth application, we would have to see this as Satan is operating through these different systems, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And so even though he's operating through these things, he's not regarding them. Does that make sense? Th that they're just a means to an end. But all of these things, to some degree, he uses. So he doesn't regard the gods of his fathers, right? So 
we're saying, you know, the pagan and papal gods, as, as far as, you know, Satan is concerned, those are just a means to an end, right? Now, the everlasting gospel of the three angels' messages, he doesn't regard, of course, the desire of women. And the desire of women, you could say, is Christ, right? The promised seed. He doesn't really regard it. He uses Christianity, right? But he doesn't regard it. And he doesn't regard any God, even all of these different systems and philosophies and so forth that Satan inhabits and uses. He doesn't, he doesn't put any of these things above him because he magnifies himself above all. That definitely has to be the way that we look at verse 37. So then when we get to verse 38, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. Now we're going to say that he's not honoring the almighty God, the God of forces. So we're going to say that the almighty God, and I'm just going to put um, here in this text, I, I, I would normally capitalize the word almighty, but as to the almighty God, he shall honor in his seat. And so, so if we're going to take it this way, I'm just going to cut this out. He shall honor uh, maybe in his place. So I'm going to put here in his place. Yea, he shall honor a God whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. Now, does that make sense? And we're saying that this is a God whom his fathers knew not. So we know that he doesn't regard the God of his fathers, but then a God that his fathers knew not that he's going to honor with gold, silver, precious stones and pleasant things. Now, if this now this is the papacy. So is the papacy putting Satan in the place of Christ and honoring Satan in, in a more direct way than paganism? Right. Because we, we would say, well, paganism, that's satanic worship. But. The idea here is that Satan is put in the place of Christ, and that makes him a God that his fathers knew not. Does that make sense to people? So this God would be a, if we're going to, we'll just say a counterfeit Christ. Maybe that helps. Does that make sense? It can. Because definitely this would not be who their fathers knew, right? This would not be a God that their fathers knew. Right, the fathers being pagan Rome, paganism. They don't know of this Christ, but this counterfeit Christ is the one that he's honoring, and he's honoring in the place of Christ, not just in a sense of replacing Christ, but but that's where the idea would come from. He's replacing Christ with this counterfeit Christ. And so he honors him in his place, right? In his estate. And he's honoring this counterfeit Christ with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. So, so this preserves the idea that this God of fortresses is a reference to the Almighty God. It also resolves the issue of dealing with the estate, whose place it is. It capitalized it so we know it's the Almighty God's place. And, and the he then, who's going to honor this God, that would then still be the papacy historically, uh, but Satan in, in the present truth application. Now, this, this comes back to this idea then when we're dealing, talking about the daily. And, you know, I, I don't think I expressed myself very well yesterday. I talked a lot, but I didn't, I didn't say things as clearly as I could regarding that. And I still don't know exactly. I, I had some words when I was going for a walk. I thought about it. I thought of how I should have said it. But the basic idea is we have this counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary, which we call paganism. And we have a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary, which we call paganism. And when we look at the idea of the daily, what the pioneers were, maybe not the pioneers, but the, the ad, early Adventist church, let's say, was trying to do after we had an understanding of the sanctuary is they felt that we had, we had left something out in Daniel chapter eight and that we didn't understand it fully, that Miller didn't understand it fully. And that if we could somehow see Christ, heavenly sanctuary ministry in Daniel chapter eight, that would give support for Adventism. The problem is, of course, they'd already reject, rejected the prophetic foundation and didn't see how they tied together. They didn't see that Miller's view of the two desolations, two desolating powers, paganism and papalism, fit into the daily and the transgression of desolation. 
because they had rejected the 2520. They didn't have an understanding of it. But we do know that there is a truth in there, and that is that Catholicism is a counterfeit of the heavenly sanctuary. The power that has to be removed is not Christ. It's, it's paganism. But there is a way in which Satan, in the 1260, in 2 Thessalonians, he's going to be sitting in the temple of God. Now, the temple of God, I mean, there's, there is no temple of God right now other than the human heart on earth, right? We don't, we don't have any temple of God on earth right now, except the human heart. But Satan is not in heaven. But Ellen White saw in representative vision, you know, Satan in the holy place, breathing his influence. A lot of light and power, but no sweet love, joy, and peace. Okay, so, so in his place, I mean, that place can be in heaven, but really, isn't it about that place that Christ should be is in the human heart. That is, Satan sets up his his place in the human heart, right? It, it, I mean, that's how Satan is going to be enthroned in his mind. Does that sound too um, airy-fairy? Does that make sense? Yes, it makes sense. Acts 7.38 says, uh, The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. It's definitely the human mind. Right. And, and Satan has, has usurped uh, the Almighty God. In, in most people's minds, he's usurped Christ as the God of this world. So when people think about God, they, they don't know God. They just know the representation that, that we have of God through the various churches, through the media and so forth. And it's, it's not the same God that I worship, you know, and we, we can th just think about the, the popular conception of God, the popular Christian conception of God or Catholic conception of God. So so his place is the sanctuary, but it's not so much the sanctuary in heaven. It's, it's what's happening on earth. So his place, you know, is the human heart, right? So, I mean, we could put that there. That's the place where Satan has set up his counterfeit Christ. So, so this makes makes sense. But as to the Almighty God, uh, shall he honor in his place? Yea, he shall honor a God, a counterfeit Christ, whom I don't know why, whom his fathers knew not with gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. And we can see that just 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 easily moves into a present truth application. It, it describes the papacy. Because it's not like the papacy has a specific, I mean, we could say, you know, it has Jerusalem at some point or whatever, but it's not really about any earthly place other than the human heart that the papacy really has set up its counterfeit Christ. That, that's really where it is, is attempted to do this. So we know there's a kind of a truth there in, in the new view of the daily as far as the idea of the Catholic Church and its role. Just the real problem is saying that the da daily represents Christ, Christ's ministry. It has to be removed. It, it, it is, in a sense, a result that, that does kind of happen. There's a counterfeit Christ. Satan himself is sitting in the temple of God showing that he's God. But if, if you don't understand the daily, that it refers to paganism, then everything falls apart in Adventism. As far as I'm concerned, I, I don't see how you could take the new view of the daily. And I, and I remember when I was in university and I wrote a paper on Daniel chapter eight, that I had real problems because I only knew the new view of the daily. And I had real problems trying to make it make sense. I just sort of, you know, glossed over some of the problems in my paper. But, you know, we can see now that they can't be glossed over. So if we're going to go, you know, if we're going to put up here above, we'll, we'll do it above. We're going to keep that sentence they're separate. We're not going to modify the whole, the whole thing. So in his estate, that is Christ's, in Christ's estate, shall he, that's going to be the papacy, honor the God of fortresses. So that, that doesn't really work. I mean, if, you know, that sentence doesn't work. Shall he, the papacy, uh, honor, and then what we would have to do, say, We'd have to add this here. We'd have to go in the place of, right? So that would be added in the place of the God of fortresses. 
a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor. So it's just in the place of the God of fortresses in his estate. He's good. The papacy is going to honor in the place of the God of fortresses, a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor. Right. So, um, so it's just repeating that it's a different sentence order, but it, it still can work. So this God, um, so here we, we change this. We go back to just God. We're not going to change that to, uh, the true God, right? We're just going to say that that's God, a God whom his fathers knew not. So we're going to say the counterfeit Christ or a counterfeit Christ. Maybe I'll put that lowercase. So shall I should do that here too. The counterfeit Christ shall he honor with gold, silver, and precious stones. And so we have this here with honors with idolatrous worship. We're just going to say, take this so then if we put in a present truth application, so it's still going to be Christ in a Christ estate, shall he, the papacy, so the papacy was a historical application. We're going to have here Satan. That is, Satan is really the one who's being put on the throne of the earth. And, and then again, in the place of, we're going to change this. We have to change this as well. So it's God. And instead of fortresses, I'm going to put the God of strength. Now, we had here, you know, we had in the other one, we, we were dealing with the supreme religious authority. And now we're saying supreme civil authority. We're looking at strength in that sense. But we're just going to leave this out, right? Because that, that then gives a different sense. Yeah. So so a God whom his fathers knew not is counterfeit counterfeit Christ shall he honor, right? So he's going to honor it in the place of Christ. And it's going to be this counterfeit Christ that he honors with all of this idolatrous worship. So, so if we deal with this counterfeit Christ, and we, I mean, we could just say it's, it's the same in the present truth application, but can we be more specific about what that counterfeit Christ is? We know that, you know, Satan here, is the present truth application of the papacy, right? So, I mean, we could just say the Antichrist, Antichrist, because that's going to be Satan's personation of Christ. Now, we know that in the present truth application, it's not going to be about the gold, silver, precious stones, and pleasant things. That it's not so much about I idolatrous worship, but we can say he's going to honor him through the counterfeit Sabbath, Sunday. And I'll say his counterfeit. Does that make sense? You know, remember, these are just always placeholders. We change a lot of these things. And we have to think a lot about what that Sunday represents. You know, buying and selling, all of the different characteristics, you know, this image of the beast. You know, we could almost say that, you know, instead of the counterfeit Christ, just the image to the beast. But, you know, that's sort of, a, it's not really a counterfeit of the beast. But any any thoughts on this? I don't know, is this is this making sense to people? I need a bit of feedback. I think this is a lot more logical than a lot of the things that we had observed from either Smith or any of these others that, that we've looked at in the past. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I definitely think so. Uh, there's a lot here. But it, it 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 fits in with Second Thessalonians. I mean, that's the whole thing that we're finding here, is that this is because Ellen White compares this to second Thessalonians, right? I mean, that's one of the best arguments against Uriah Smith's view of these verses where he tries to make this to be France is how Ellen White ties it to the language of second Thessalonians chapter two. So to me, she's, she's clearly comparing this. No. She's, she's not describing it as something that happened with France. She's is describing as as the papacy yeah by doing it in that way is she also not following not only miller's rules but miller's logic because by comparing this with second thessalonians is she not comparing it with the man of sin yes that's what she's doing right she okay. she's showing that this is the man of sin it's it's the, and and i don't see how anybody could not see it unless god has been holding his hand over this for it to be discovered as a time such as this. 
well, James James White seemed to understand it, you know, but but definitely it was not Uriah Smith's view had had a lot of weight. It, it appears it had more weight than James White's view, and and I'm not really sure why because. I mean, we've spent a lot of time studying Daniel chapter 11. And so we have a lot more insight to it, into it than the average Adventist because we've, we've torn it all apart. You know, we've examined every, every aspect of it so far. And we can see the flow and, and how this is connecting with these other chapters. Now, we, we originally had studied before we got into Daniel chapter 11 itself. Remember, we spent time looking at Daniel 12, or not Daniel, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, because we were looking at, at the context of, you know, the, the, the riddle, right, of Revelation 17. So we spent a lot of time examining those. But we can see here clearly how Daniel chapter 11 is addressing those, those chapters, even though they're written after, but you understand what I mean. You know, they're those chapters are addressing Daniel chapter 11, I guess, technically, I should say. But they're addressing the same thing. They're, they're talking about the same issues. And they're giving that history in much the same way. So it, it just makes sense that this, that, that this fits. And, and then when we look at 2 Thessalonians, we know that that is where uh, William Miller came to understand the daily, Right. It was because of Second Thessalonians. Correct. So we can see that a correct understanding of the daily is essential to understand Second Thessalonians and to understand, obviously, not just the daily in Daniel chapter 8, but the daily and the abomination of desolation in Daniel 11, verse 31, and 12, verse 11, right? So... It's going to talk about this. And, and we know that there is a difference in Daniel chapter 8, which Miller wasn't quite able to discern because there's two different Hebrew words there, uh, sir and room, right? So, so he, he made a, you know, a, a partial error, but it wasn't, it wasn't fatal to, to him understanding uh, Daniel chapter 8. It's just, you know, as far as the 2300 days. Uh, but we have more insight into some of the details of so we can see that, you know, there's this different Hebrew word. And so really it's talking there in Daniel chapter eight, more it's referring more to the setting up of the lifting up and exalting of, of paganism through the papacy. But in Daniel chapter 11, verse 31 and uh, 12, verse 11, it's, it's definitely talking about the taking away of the daily, not the lifting up and exalting of the daily, because it's going to be taken out of the way, and then they're going to be given the abomination of, of desolation. But right? that's going to be set up. So, so, that, so they they fit together. It's just that you know we understand a little bit more of the the, the technical arguments over the the Hebrew and what it's actually saying. But it doesn't essentially change what Miller is saying. It's, it agrees with it. So I'm pretty happy with this. I mean, um, it's definitely different than what we had, but we can see how this. Um, how Satan is going to be honored. It's obviously, you know, we're not going to make images literally, you know, to Satan to worship him. But his spirit, his lies, his character is going to, we're going to perceive that as Christ. And people so much so that they believe that they're following God when they're seeking to murder God's people. And we can see how that spirit exists, not, not in that extreme sense necessarily now, but just, you know, in how we talk about others, how we look at others, how we think about others. It's a satanic spirit. If, if we had the spirit of Christ, we wouldn't be so condemnatory of people who have gone astray. Because God's not contem condemnatory of us, and we've gone astray. I mean, he's loving and compassionate. He seeks to draw us to him. And as Christians, often we, we, we exalt in people who have gone astray because we're comparing ourselves with them and think we're better than they are. So, you know, there's a lot to this. It's a very deep thing. And that's what I was trying to get to, just the spiritual aspect of it in, in yesterday. So, and, and just to come back to that point and just sort of clarify, those that are going to be on the side of Satan in the end, have made choices in their life day by day 
to push away any light that might condemn them, anything that might show them to be sinners, and uh, live in a false belief that they are okay when they're all wrong. And the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans is a message that says, you need help. And that's not a message we want to hear. Though it's the gospel, it's good news. And those that, that are following Christ are not going to even by a thought consider that they are sinless. They would never indulge that thought for the very reason that they have come to know Christ and can see in themselves no good thing, nothing to recommend them to God. They know the only reason that they are alive is because of God. That anything that has ever happened that is good has not come from some innate quality that they have. Even though we all have innate qualities, those innate qualities without God using them are meaningless. All of the talents of the world, all of the intellect, all of the skills, if they're not utilized by God, by Christ, they all will be used for Satan's kingdom instead of for Christ's kingdom. And so, you know, so people are making spiritual decisions and the people in the end who are going to stand for the truth are not necessarily the ones who were the most um, intellectually and spiritually orthodox, like, you know, understood the scriptures in the most correct way. They may not have understood the true view of the daily or, or many other truths of scripture. Uh, they may not have had an understanding of it. But when they see what's happening on this earth, because of the choices that they have made, because they seek to follow God, they will embrace the truth when it is demonstrated. And they will die for the truth. And many of those who have believed the correct things who have been stalwart supporters of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, solid, conservative Seventh-day Adventists, will be lost. And they will be lost because they have never manifested Christ's character. And we don't want to be among that group. And we can see in these end times of how this, you know, when we think about the papacy and we think about, you know, we think about the Catholic Church and all their crazy beliefs and and the persecution and, and all the martyrs and, and, you know, just all of the blasphemy. Well, it's easy to look at that and say, well, I'm not like that. But are you not like that? Are we not like that? All that is is just a manifestation of human nature. And all of us are human. All of us have manifested all of those things in some way or another. Maybe not in that external way that we see in the Catholic Church. But definitely we've had idols in our hearts and we have persecuted with our tongue other people. We have, we have, we have, we've repeated lies. We've believed a lie. So studying these things is meant to give light into our darkened hearts and minds. That's what God is wanting to show us here. And, and we can see it that there's obviously this external manifestation of what's happening in end time events. But in, in order to not be deceived, it's not just an intellectual acknowledgement of, of all these different evils that's going to save us. It's going to be an acceptance of the truth that's going to save us, that, that's going to help us so that we're not deceived. Because it'll be easy to be deceived. Satan is going to bring an overmastering delusion. And the only people that will be able to withstand that are the ones who have developed a Christ-like character that Christ has said, let him that is righteous be righteous still. And that person will not see themselves as righteous. So I think this, this, this study here, I think this makes a lot of sense. Any comments on this? Now, this next part, uh, thus shall he do against the most strongholds. So here's where we have uh, this places of refuge. So he's going to do this against the most strongholds. So we agree, I think, on this, that the most strongholds are the places of refuge, the truth of God's word, where persecuted Christians have fled for refuge. And this makes sense from what we're talking about in, in this context. This is the Antichrist. This, well, this is the papacy during the 1260 years. And this is the Antichrist in the time of Jacob's trouble. And he's going to do this with this strange God, this syncretistic Christian God, whom he shall acknowledge. Now, um, so the word acknowledge here, 
is uh, 5234. Now this one here means to scrutinize that is intently look at. So we've looked at this before, we've intently scrutinized it, but you can see how this flows out of what has happened in the previous verse, right? And we can see um, like we had that word regard, which is a little softer word than this word acknowledge. Um, and the word acknowledge, it means you have to scrutinize, uh, be acquainted with, care for, respect, revere. And so he's going to acknowledge this false God, this synchronistic Christian God, and increase with glory. And he, the papal power, shall cause them, that is the false gods, the saints or priesthood, to rule over many, Christendom, and shall divide the land for gain. So historically, this is what happens. Now, how do we apply this in a present truth application? So when it says, thus shall he do, we know that this historically is the papacy. So I'm going to put that in there. So that's, so shall he, the papal power, do against the most strongholds. So we're going to say places of refuge, but also the truths of God's word where persecuted, persecuted Christians have fled for refuge. Now, with a strange God, the synchronistic Christian God. So we got that there. Now, when it says he shall do. Now, we've, we've, we've addressed this word before, 6213. And it, it's kind of a weird word. Like sometimes that's why they'll say he'll do exploits. And, and, and it's a word that it means to do or make in the broadest sense. But it can mean accomplish, advance, appoint, uh, become, bear, bestow, bring forth, bruise. So it's to do something or make something. So, so shall he do. So this, this action that he's doing, what is the papal power doing against the most strongholds? When you say he's doing something, like he's, he's doing what against them? So in, in this case, we could say he's persecuting. He's planning, plotting, accomplishing, advancing, maybe advancing. It might even be a better way of looking at it. Um, he's progressing, right? That's that's what ends up happening during that period of time. I, I'm going to put advancing, just because I think that, right? And and he's going to increase with glory, right? So so this is happening for the papal power. It's going to, and so the synchronistic God who he shall acknowledge is going to increase with glory, and he the papal power shall cause them. So so this develops over time to rule over many, over Christendom, shall divide the land for gain. Now, um, and remember, we, we're dealing with dividing the land. This is the idea of, of taking the land, like dividing it for lots. So that word divide is a portion. And so when they apportion the land, and, and we have there the word for gain, 4242, and we've acknowledged that that relates to uh, the 2520, the two twelve sixties. So if we're going to apply that in a present truth way, what, what is this specifically talking about? Is it talking about something specific in our time? So we know that, of course, this is not going to be really the papal power in this context. So I'm going to put that like this. In the present truth, this is... Now, yeah, we could just say it's Satan, right? But... But he's going to be doing this in what way? So what, what, is, what is the means that this he, the papal power, was in historically? Is there a way that we could describe it, describe his, who he is? And then we have to figure out what the most strongholds are in the present truth sense. I mean, we could just, I mean, we could just all leave this in just this sort of vague sort of way and not specify it. But I think this is describing Revelation chapter 13 at the end, right? So if we talk about the papal power, I'm going to say it's the image to the beast is the present truth application of what the papal power is. So the image to the beast is the issue that we have to address here in this Sabbath Sunday issue, right? So we have the image to the beast, and he's going to do, and we say advancing, now, that word do can mean make. Maybe maybe the best way to do this is, I'm just going to say the USA, or more specifically, Protestant 
more of that. This might be better. Shall do make an image to the beast, right? Because that word do can be translated as make, to do or make. We're going to just say, so the papal power advances in, in the historic time in the period of 1260. But here in the present truth application, we can see the United States Protestant America is going to make an image to the beast uh, against the most strongholds. So who is the image of the beast against? Where is the place of refuge? Obviously, God's word is there. Can, can we put just put the present truth application is that he goes against the most strongholds and the most strongholds there, the place of refuge in, in a sort of uh, more tangible, practical sense is the Sabbath. Could we do that? I say the Sabbath is a great part of it, but it's his entire word that is my refuge. Right. Yeah, it it's definitely includes his word. But I'm just looking at the aspect of what the conflict is over, because the Sabbath is this refuge, this place of rest. So when we deal with with this strange God, the syncretistic Christian God, we know that that is the Sunday, right? That's what it represents, because one is the seal of God. So maybe what we could do is say the Sabbath, that is the seal of God. And the other one is the Sunday that is the mark of the beast. And so he's going to acknowledge increase with glory. This is going to be an advancing of his, his, his power. This is a progressive Sunday law. So when it says he, the papal power, we know that this is Satan ultimately shall cause them. Now, in, in the historical application, these were the false gods, the saints, or the priesthood. But... This would be the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet to rule over many. So the dragon, beast, and false prophet. That's the threefold union. And the dividing of the land for gain. So we said this was ecclesiastical conquest through assumed papal authority. So in the present truth, this is really Satan claiming to be the god of this world. Something like that. That's Antichrist or something. Any comments on this? Any thoughts on this? Not quite yet. Okay, the one, there's there's some more details that we need to, this word rule, mashal, 4910. It's in Genesis 1, verse 18. It's first used, the law first mentioned, has it in Genesis 1, 18, to rule over the day and over the night, to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Now, when we think about this rule, you know, the, we, we can see the sun and the moon are to rule, right? The sun rules over the day, the moon rules over the night. And that's the first time it's mentioned. We also see it in Genesis 37, 8, when we're going to have this uh, dream of, of Joseph. And he's going to have this dream where the sheaves bow, right? And then he says, uh, shall thou indeed reign over us? Shall thou have dominion over us? Now that word dominion there, is is the doubling of this word, mashal. It just says mashal, mashal, right? So that's uh, the superlative. And it's, you know, 4910, it mentions it twice. Shalt thou indeed, right? That's the indeed part is because it's doubled. And, and then he's going to have the dream where the sun and the moon and the 11 stars make obeisance to him. And then uh, Jacob says, shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow ourselves to the, to the earth and bow down ourselves? And that word bow down ourselves is 7812, the Hebrew number. We can see the July 18, 2020 symbol there. And we also see it in Judges 14, 4, but his father and his mother knew not that it was of the Lord that he sought an occasion against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So that word dominion is that same word, mashal. So um, what do we make of that? So this idea that, and he shall cause them to rule. So there's some more detail in, in that word rule. So what have we we've learned? We can connect it to the story of Samson, and this, we can connect it to the story of Joseph, connect, connect it to the sun and the moon in their original creation. 
So what kind of rule is this? And normally we use the numbers for the present truth application. So obviously we know that the papacy is going to rule, right? It has this uh, papal authority, right? It um, rules in Christendom, it sets up gods, kings, takes down kings, all of those types of things. Is there anything more we can make from this number 4910, this, this word, rule, Michelle? It seems to be ma mainly talking of man's rule. You know, I, I don't, I mean, I haven't checked through all the mean, all of the times that, that mm. it appears in scripture, but I was wondering if there, if there are any scriptures that have God's rule with the same word used. Well, so yeah. Have to do that yes. Now. Yeah. It can be God's rule. I mean, it's dominion. Right. So we know the sun and the moon have dominion. So that's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. It's used in Psalm 89, verse 9. Thou rulest the raging of the sea when the waves thereof oh, arise. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just that God has given things to rule. This is what I remember about this word. Now, the word ruler, when, when you hear the word ruler, what do you think of? Well, unfortunately, the first thing that comes to mind is a uh, uh, human ruler. Man, it shouldn't be that way. Okay. But but also, what about a measuring device, a ruler? Correct. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Right? Line up now, the line. Right. So, so we know that he gives the sun and the moon to rule, right? And, and the context of that rule is that we can say it's dominion. But it, it really has to do with the idea of a ruler uh, comes from, from a ruler, right? The reason we call it a ruler is because a ruler, a king, has, has created this measurement, this standard in which we measure things, right? So the reason it's called a ruler is because it's named after the idea of a ruler, right? A king, an authority that, that, that is this standard, right? And we know the sun and the moon were given to have dominion or be rulers over time, right? They rule or measure the day and they rule or measure the night, okay? So if we can think of this word as rule, what about changing times and laws? Is that something that the Catholic Church does? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, it's certainly mm -hmm. Okay. So this would be a reference to the papal power of setting up false feasts and Sabbaths. How's that? Sure. Okay. And also Genesis 49.10, uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come. Whenever I say 49.10, I think of that. Okay. So, so we can see that, that this, it causes them to rule that, that this is actually referring to this, this aspect of the calendar. Okay. So, so we can see that that's something that the papacy does. It sets up, it changes times and laws. So let me just go I E times and laws. So I, that's the important thing about that word rule. I, I knew there was something there because it's, it's not just so much that you know they have control. It's the type of control, what they have control over. And it's something that God has given the sun and the moon, right? That is the calendar that God has given is a lunar solar calendar. The papacy doesn't use a lunar solar calendar. Now, I get a lot of a flack from some, some people out there who just say, you know, you should never use the Gregorian or the Julian calendar because... Julian's a pagan Roman calendar, and uh, Gregorian's a papal Roman calendar, and the Mayan calendar is, you know, some kind of pagan calendar. And, and, and I would agree in a sense. I mean, there's obviously God's calendar. God's timekeeping piece is the sky. The sun and the moon and the stars, the planets and the movements in the heavens were given for times, for, for signs, for seasons, for days and years. But the re reality is these things exist and they can be used as symbols. So, you know, it's not like it's some sin, you know, to say I was born February 6, 1963, because I'm using a pagan calendar. But there are some people that, you know, that that's paganism. I mean, that's as bad as, you know, keeping Sunday, you know, if you're going to 
and also even acknowledging that you have a birthday is somehow pagan too, right? Because we the only examples of birthdays in the Bible are Herod's and Pharaoh's. So, you know, but obviously, you know, we all have birthdays, we all have anniversaries, nothing wrong with knowing how old you are, and nothing wrong with knowing how old you are on a papal Roman calendar, right? Nothing wrong with that. But obviously, that that is something that that the Catholic Church has used, this ability to set up false feasts, to change times and laws, that it has ruled Christendom through that way. And that, of course, includes the Sunday, right? So this fits in specifically with what we're talking about here. Okay, now dividing the land, we dealt with that a bit. I'm not totally satisfied. I mean, obviously, I know it means um, to to portion or apportion the land. And then we have the gain. So we got the that symbol of the two 1260s, 4242. But there still must be something there. Because when I think about this dividing, I think of it, well, I mean, it is dividing of the of the 2520 into two 1260s. We, we can agree with that that this is this counterfeit covenant. And, and that's kind of the, the main thing that I want to, to be seen there is that this is about, because when you, when you divide an animal in half, right, you're going to cut a covenant, you're going to divide the animal in half and you walk between it, right? So, so this to me represents this counterfeit covenant. So dividing the land, I see as a counterfeit covenant. This apportioning, this giving of the lot of the land. They're, 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 well, I'll just put that in. I'll just put in. You know, it's not. Well, Satan said to Christ, "All this power will I give thee if thou wilt bow down and worship me." And he showed him all of the kingdoms mm-hmm. of this world for the end of time. So that sure fits in there. Huh? Yeah, and and it, but it's done through these two twelve six. So I mean, we have that as a footnote with the forty two forty two, but dividing the land for gain is. You know, it's these two count these these two because it's a counterfeit of the cross, right? Where Christ is crucified in the midst of the week, he's crucified between the two thieves, the two classes of worshippers. And and we can see, of course, the two twelve sixties, paganism and papalism. You always have these chiasms. It's a chiasm. The cross itself is a chiasm, um, especially with the two thieves, one on either side. And and Satan has a counterfeit of that. Christ is confirming the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he's going to cause sacrifice and oblation to cease, right? And, and then it's going to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem. So to me, this dividing the land for gain is a reference to this idea. And it's, and it's there in that word gain, 42, 42. But it, it's there even without that, that Hebrew number, right? This, that this is a counterfeit covenant. God makes a covenant with people He's going to give them their portion for the 12 tribes, right, of the land of Israel. But Satan is dividing the land for gain, for himself. He wants this world as his own. So uh, to me, that's just, it, it all seems very clear. I know when I, when I put this paper together and I write all the explanations of everything in more detail, we can just see how these things are flowing out of each other and how they're connecting, you know, to Revelation 12, Revelation 13, uh, Revelation 14 even. And, th- and that's what I like to see. I mean, if, if I'm studying the scriptures, I want to see everything come together, that it becomes clearer, becomes more in focus. And, and I think that's what this study, this week has, has been a really good study, I think, as far as bringing some of these things into focus. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the study this morning and for this day, for this past week, and all the blessings, and even the trials, Lord. We know, Lord, that uh, Dwight has some things to face that are very difficult for any person to face. We just pray for him, for his mom, for his family. And for the opportunities that we have to represent your character to those around us. Thank you for the decisions that you help us make each day. And we ask for your continued care and guidance and that we can know how to do what is right. Give us strength. Bring us together again to study your word tomorrow evening. 
and on Sabbath. We pray for the studies coming up and we need your presence every moment. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.